Welcome to the session dealing with the Geniza. Uh, my name is Yair Newman and I'm going to chair this session and according to Chaim's request, Biat Chazaka was on it, we are. If the video camera is ready, and I can uh, invite the first speaker, who is Dr. Craig Perry. Uh, Dr. Perry is a historian of the medieval Middle East and focuses on the social history of domestic slavery in Islamic societies. And Craig just received his PhD, so congratulations from Harry University, where he completed the dissertation based on the documentary sources from the career with Nizan. Okay, Craig, welcome. Thank you very much. I, I want to begin um, by introducing a, a document um, that I think introduces some key themes in the study of domestic slavery in the, in the Cairo Geniza as it relates to the theme of, of conversion. This is a legal agreement from the late 11th century, dated to 1091. But uh, you know, as Geniza documents go, it's not in horrible condition, um, despite appearances, and it is a an agreement between a Parnas, this is a local communal welfare official named Ellie Ben Kohane, and a woman only identified in the document as the mother of Saad al Mulk. The purpose of the agreement is the mother of Saad al Mulk is stating that she is absolutely dedicated to helping find a marital match for the slave woman or the freed slave woman Mubaraka. How do we know that the woman Mubaraka, who is the subject of this legal agreement, is a freed slave? Because in fact that word is not in the surviving document. So we can piece back together um, from what would probably be in this large lacuna here on the right side of the document, um, that she is the blank of somebody, Abu, we don't know, he has a, uh, uh, perhaps Abu is, I think, called Mubaraka, and she said that she was from, and then right when we're gonna find out where she was from, uh, another lacuna. So the way that freed slave women are often identified is as the freed woman of their former masters. So that's one clue we have. So Mashukheret would probably be the word right in front of Abu. In indicating that she's the freed woman of a certain Abu so-and-so. Second, and per perhaps a better evidence, is the name Mubaraka is adopted by converts and freed slaves. So we've seen in Marta's talk that uh, converts often had a very distinct identifying names in this um, Austrian context. So too in the Geniza, uh, Mubarak for men and Mubaraka for women is an identifying name meaning blessed I think meant to emphasize the piety of the new convert to Judaism. And so we almost, not invariably, but almost so find the name Mubaraka attached to freed women. So on this basis, I feel very comfortable saying that Mubaraka is a freed woman. The other important piece of information in here is that twice we find the phrase biwahid min ashabana al-Yahud, meaning that the mother of Saad al muk is trying to find a marital match with one of our co-religionists, the Jews. So this document then illustrates a case in which a freed slave is seeking communal support and I think she's a willing part of this agreement because she's given a voice in the document, um, explains where she is from and it explains that Sadal, the mother of Saad al-Mulk explains that she's only going to find a marital match that Mubaraka approves of. So we have here a really interesting document from the late 11th century which raises some interesting questions about 
conversion and slaves based on uh, the Cairo Geniza. One question would be, is Mubaraka indicative of a larger social trend, or is this kind of case exceptional? And then, what, as far as the Jewish community is concerned, was, is the support that the Jewish community demonstrates for Mubaraka itself exceptional, and is it indicative of the overall attitude of Egyptian Jews towards slaves as converts, and then also as uh, marital matches for Jewish, uh, Jewish men in Cairo? A second question that I'll address in this talk is, what is the viewpoint of a slave woman herself about conversion, and how might a slave relate to conversion or use conversion as a, a strategy or a tactic to advance her own self-interests? So there are three uh, questions that I'd like to address in this talk. First of all would be, how did the Egyptian Jewish community support the conversion of young slave girls and their integration into Jewish social life? So I'm going to argue that based on the surviving Geniza evidence that Egyptian Jews did support the conversion and integration of young slave women, and I'm emphasizing young for a reason, into the, into the Jewish community, especially girls from the age range of about six years old into their mid to later teenage years. We do find women who converts who were older, but I think there was particular openness towards younger slave women. Further, Jew, uh, Jewish slave motors provided inducements <laughs> that encouraged the conversion of slaves to Judaism and their continuing profession of Judaism. Framed another way, we might call inducements something else. We might call them gifts to people, slaves who are recognized as household dependents. And these gifts were meant to serve as a form of economic and social capital that aided the slave in her transition from slave to free and to member of the Jewish community. Second, I want to try to be explicit um, about what I do mean by conversion in this context, and I want to thank Ryan for framing this issue so articulately last night. So when I speak about conversion of slaves and on the basis of Geniza documents, um, I want to underscore that we're seeing really two groups. We see slaves in the Geniza, and then we see freed women. And so when I talk about slave conversion, I'm usually talking about um, both of these groups consider freed women a subset of slaves as former slaves. Uh, we rarely see um, the actual moment of conversion or discussion of the ritual aspects of the conversion of a slave. We see the slave, we see the freed woman, and when we see a freed woman who's married to a Jew, for example, we, are, I, we assume that she became Jewish at some point. But if there, aside from discussions of this in rabbinic responsa, there are no kind of uh, smoking guns, per se, of the actual act of conversion, with very, very few exceptions. So when we talk about conversion, we're talking about the process of integrating former slaves into the Jewish community as a free Jew through manumission, through social support, and through marriage. So there is, uh, um, as Kenneth mentioned last night, there is the perspective of the uh, religious body on conversion and the individual. So it is a communal concern, I think, conversion of slaves and freed slaves to Judaism. Second, uh, when I talk about conversion, I'm talking about the willful actions of the slaves and some isolated incidents that refer that reveal how slaves use conversion to assert their own self-interest. And I'll talk about a couple of these examples from rabbinic responsa of Moses and Abraham Maimonides. More broadly, I want to also explain what the study of slave conversion specifically gets us as opposed to the study of other kinds of conversions in the medieval Middle East because it provides I think a window onto the social history of conversion of groups who are more marginally and socio uh, more marginal in socioeconomic terms so an investigation of slave conversions then generates questions about how conversion may have different meanings and significance depending upon the convert's socioeconomic position and the specific concerns of the local community into which the convert entered. For Jewish history too, the study of slave conversion highlights and illustrates another way in which slaves and freed women were a constituative, constitutive part of the local Jewish community. Before I dive into some specific examples and explain 
the specifics of slave conversion, I want to say something about representativeness of Geniza sources and of freed women and converts to Judaism in the Cairo Geniza. So that in the overall corpus of Geniza documents related to slaves, which number currently in, in, in the few hundreds, about one third of these documents mention freed women specifically. So one of every three documents that has anything to do with slavery mentions the freed woman. So the question is, is this a, a real trend? Was manumission so common in the Cairo Geniz as reflected by this number? So I've thought a lot about this issue and I want to get at it by looking at these two writs of manumission. So if you can compare in your mind the, the physical state of these two writs compared to the document, the legal document concerning Mubaraka, you see a very big difference. Writs of manumission are invariably, with one exception that I know of, extremely well preserved. They're very carefully taken care of. The versos are not generally reused for other purposes. Why is this? The writ of manumission was proof of a woman's freedom. It was proof of her marriageable status, and it certified the status of her children. And we have court cases where judges asked for writs of manumission because they wanted to certify the timing of a manumission in relation to a free woman's marriage to a Jewish man. So I argue, I want to suggest that there was extreme incentive to retain writs of manumission in the Geniza. Also, when a woman converted to Judaism, she became part of the document stream created by Jewish courts. She married, she might divorce, she might show up as a litigant in a Jewish court case. And so freed women, as opposed to slaves, were much more likely for various reasons to become documented, right? To occasion the creation of a historical source that then made its way to the Geniza. So I want to put a caveat on the, my discussion and <coughs> put question marks around the representativeness or the frequency that's apparent in the Geniza of manumission because I think there's a logic to how documentary sources survive that we have to keep in mind and that may skew the portrait of how frequent manumission was and so I want to be transparent about that and flag that for us. So the one argument I want to make has to do with the specific circumstances in medieval Cairo that were relevant to attitudes towards slave women who converted to Judaism and became part of the community. So recent work by uh, my colleague Eve Krakowski on female adolescence has illustrated that the Jewish community was very concerned with the status of unmarried female orphans and in providing for these orphans until their first marriage, which usually happened in mid to late teenage years. Krakowski argues that unmarried female orphans were viewed as intrinsic dependents and that they needed to be cared for. The Mishnah Torah, a legal compendium compiled by Moses Maimonides, itself conflates the plight of orphans and slaves and encourages individuals to make use of orphans in lieu of slaves as household dependents. Specifically, communal efforts were made to provide unmarried orphan girls with ongoing material support as well as a dowry and in some cases basic religious instruction. So here I'm juxtaposing pieces of two documents. On the left, this is a letter by um, an Egyptian Jewish woman to a communal welfare official and she's encouraging him to provide support so that two sisters, both orphans, the father has died, so that they can rent an apartment near her. Right? And that also is asking that they be provided with two dinars so that they can buy silk and other materials to embroider and sell as marketable goods or potentially retain as part of a future, dow a future dowry for a marriage. On the right, um, as a document I'll discuss in just a moment, it is the from a, a deathbed will in which a, a wealthy widow frees her two slave girls and provides them with lodging and clothing as conditions of their manumission and also on the condition that they, quote, profess the Jewish faith. So I want to suggest that there's a consistency between the attitude of the community towards unmarried female orphans and female slave girls. Something else that explains the concern for both orphans and for 
uh, slave girls was the real chance that such intrinsic dependence could fall into chronic, what Mark Cohen would call uh, chronic poverty. This is an example of an alms list from the early, uh, the very early 12th century from the year 1107, and I've just highlighted uh, the word Algeria, which is misspelled um, at the top, meaning a slave girl who's receiving an allotment of wheat. And then also uh, a woman who I don't know if she is the same woman I've discussed named Mubaraka, who's also on the alms list receiving a, an allotment of wheat. Both of these women are not attached to a household or dependent upon communal charity for their sustenance. And so I think there was a real concern and a, a reality that intrinsic dependence like orphans and slave girls could become part of the chronic poor and become a kind of burden on the local community. So I argue that there's incentive for the community to find marital matches for manumitted slave girls and for like they would find for unmarried orphans. A third factor that I want to highlight is clientage. So ties of clientage, that is master-slave, which morphs then into patron-client. These ties of patronage are evident in relations between Jews and their manumitted slaves. Now, in the letter of a bill, Jewish bill of manumission, the, the severance between a master and his slave is supposed to be complete. This contrasts to the legal position of masters and slaves in Islamic law, where there is an institution called wala, which creates specified ties between a master and a slave even after manumission. So while in the letter of Jewish law there, is, there are not those legal formal ties between master and slave, I see in the Geniza practices that actually do resemble, however, master-slave relationships that turn into patron-client relationships. Some of this is evidenced in the way that we see slave women mentioned in documents years and years after their manumission. And here's just one example of a slave, um, slave woman, a slave named Muna, who is freed, but even at her marriage is still referred to as the, the freed woman of so-and-so, um, her former master, as a way of identifying her in the sort of social universe of the world of the Geniza. So, this, the way that free women are continually have this stamp upon them throughout their lives, as far as I can tell, is another piece of information, as well as the behavior and actions of masters towards their slaves, that underscores there, I think, was a tie of clientage between former masters and their slaves. And I think that this practice of clientage and patronage exerted an integrative force, right? Created a concern of masters for their former slaves that pulled freed slaves or made freed slaves more likely to be pulled and kept in the orbit of the Egyptian Jewish community. So I want to now present two examples, specific examples which I believe illustrate the broad themes that I've just discussed. So one that I've referred to previously, this is a, a deathbed will and testament of a wealthy widow named Sit al Husn. This is from the mid, mid 12th century. So Sit al Husn has her second husband, survives her, Natan bin Shimuel, the diadem of the scholars. And she has two slave girls, the Hab and Sit al Samar, who are definitely, I think, before the age of, before their teenage years. They're documented in other documents before this one that indicate their young age, but I don't, I don't know precisely how old they were. These are the only heirs to whom Sit al Husn leaves anything in her will, and she was considerably wealthy. So in her will, she stipulates that her virgin slave girls, the Hab and Sit al Summer, will be given one quarter of a house in partnership with a, that she, that Sit al Husn had. And then in addition to this, she gave to the community, Le Kodesh, one half of the house in which she lived. So this is an additional property she's giving them. So that the two slave girls could live there for the rest of their lives in the part that belongs to the community and where the will is being witnessed on the condition that the slave girls profess the Jewish faith. The final stipulation is added regarding the slave girls' inheritance. If something should remain from the income of one eighth of the aforementioned house, it shall be given to the slave girls. Likewise, they shall be given all clothing suitable for women. In a lot of ways, the two slave girls, the Hab and Satel Sumer, in this particular instance, function almost like daughters would to a, a, a woman who had heirs or other children. 
and, and this is something we could discuss, but I want to focus on the way that these two slave girls are present, um, provided with material support. And I want to draw the parallel between the, the gift of clothing, which was a movable monetary asset and also a marker of social status, was also something that would be included in wedding dowries of Jewish women who are entering into their first marriage. I argue that the way that Sal Husson treats her two slaves reflects the same kind of care that the Jewish community exhibited towards orphaned Jewish women and is one reason or reflects a concern for integrating in, uh, freed slaves into the community and providing them with material support. Second case. This is a, another deathbed testament of Abul Hassan. So Abu Hassan also frees two slaves. He manumits one of them outright with no qualifications or further discussion whatsoever. But he has a second slave though named Kashf and to her manumission he adds a really interesting stipulation. The young girl Kashf shall remain with my younger sister or my young sister Sit al Riyasa until she is old enough to make her own choices. <laughs> then if she wants to remain, she shall remain. And if she chooses to leave, she shall leave. Kash was a minor, probably a child, based on the way that she's described al-Sarira in the source. And Abu Hassan's formulation, I argue, reveals or indicates that he views her, or she's viewed as an intrinsic dependent, one who's not able to take care of herself even though she would be manumitted. But the choice here of his words, if she wants to remain, she shall remain, and if she chooses to leave, she shall leave, indicates an openness on the part of Abu Hassan and his family, and perhaps a hope that Kashfa will remain with the family after she reaches an age of maturity, most likely in her later teenage years, and would be at the age of first marriage. Now Kashf's case contrasts to the Hob and Sital Summers, because we have no mention in this, explicit mention in this particular will and testament that she is expected to profess the Jewish faith. Yet the choice that Abul Hassan sets up of remaining versus leaving implies a choice that Kash eventually has to make of integration or disintegration. It seems hard to imagine that this would be a, a choice, of, uh, really a choice at all, for a young freed slave girl with no kin or other support networks, whether she would leave the Jewish community or stay in the Jewish community. For if she chooses to leave, for what is she leaving for? We have, for example, evidence in the 11th century of Bedouin sacking Cairo during a time of famine in the Shidda of al Mustansir. And during this time, slave girls ran away with the Bedouin um, into the Sinai, for example. However, this hardly seems like an appealing option, provided that a slave had a stable home situation and, and a non-abusive master or mistress um, who adopted her in the way that Sitt al-Riyasa seems to be prepared to do with Kashf in this situation. If she converts to Islam at the, uh, at the age of marriage and marries a Muslim, this is certainly a possibility, but how would she secure such a marital match and how would she have confidence in the quality of her match or the personality or wealth or status of the, the potential marital match? So I want to offer two provisional conclusions here um, about the attitude of the Jewish community towards slaves as converts. I do think that they sought to protect and integrate young slave girls into the Jewish community and that this tendency recognizes the durability and the pull of master-slave clientage. I think there was a recognized relationship between master and slave that continued after manumission and that also the attitude of Jewish, the Jewish community towards slave girls parallels other attitudes towards unprotected or dependent young Jewish women in the community, namely orphans. I think there was also, this highlights the practical side of conversion from the perspective of the Jewish community, and that is slave women who were not attached, who were not integrated into families or through marriage, could become part of the chronic poor. And this did not benefit the Jewish community. However, we know from alms lists that slave women did end up on the dole and for some time, for long, long periods of time. So another thing I think this highlights is particular to conversions of slaves. So one of the central traumas of slavery is deracination or natal alienation. And that the slave differs from other 
marginal groups and that a slave is ripped out of kin networks that previously ordered a slave's social universe. Conversion represents for a slave a kind of reversal of deracination and natal alienation because it allows them to adopt a new name and to form new kin networks within the Jewish community. And so I think that the, what we see happening to the hub in Sittal Summer in Kash through conversion or potential conversion is a way of mitigating one of the traumas of slavery, which was natal alienation and deracination. So the second part of this talk, I'd like to shift the focus to the perspective of slave girls themselves and to try to understand how might have slaves viewed conversion. This is a very difficult topic to, uh, to wrap our minds around as it's hard to see because slaves did not leave their own written records. We're seeing their actions and thoughts through the um, eyes of, ma of their masters, most generally. But I do want to look at two rabbinic responsa, which I find very interesting because of the way they demonstrate slaves using conversion um, to shape their own self-interests. I'm going to be focusing primarily on the response of queries sent to first um, to Abraham Maimonides, and then I'll look at a responsum query sent to his father Moses Maimonides. Um, this uh, re responsa um, details a, a slave girl who passes through six different masters in a very convoluted story, um, which I won't read in detail. Her last master uh, is a woman who beats her publicly in the presence of, as the response McCurry says, non-Jews. And then we get uh, the, the response um, switches abruptly from Judeo-Arabic to Hebrew, that the slave girl leaves the community, min hakalal, meaning, as this has been interpreted by Goitain and others, as that she converted to Islam. This is the only instance I know of documented in um, Responsa contemporary with the Geniza records that I'm discussing of a, a slave girl's conversion to Islam. It represents an extreme point on the spectrum of slave resistance through which a slave, through this conversion, could sever her relationship with her Jewish master. It did not free her, however, because she remained a slave, but it did compel her owners to sell her. The second responsum is found uh, written or the query sent to Moses Maimonides. This one I would like to to read part of the query to you. What does our master say in the matter of a young man who purchases a beautiful maidservant and she is with him in his house and the house is large? His father's wife and her three small daughters lived in the house. Then there was an argument between the young man and his brother. He summoned his brother to the judge and there were many words an argument between the two of them. Subsequently, his brother informed, informed on him to the judge that he had purchased a Christian slave girl and converted her and that he secluded himself with her. The slave girl appeared before the judge. The judge asked her, what are you? Meaning, what is your religious affiliation? She said, I'm a Jew. The judge suggested, well, you can convert to Islam. You may apostatize. Uh, um, apostatize. She rejects this notion and she says, I'm a Jew. I am the daughter of a Jewish woman. So the judge returned the slave girl to him and he took her to his house. The city gossips about him. Currently, the slave girl remains in his house." End quote. So here I find this um, to be a really interesting situation where a slave woman publicly asserts Jewishness, even when the response some query indicates that she was a Christian and um, not, in fact, the daughter of a Jewish woman. In fact, she invents for herself a Jewish lineage in a context in which she could have taken the judge up on his invitation to apostatize and to therefore rid herself of her master. Now there's an ambiguity over the religion of the judge because it's never directly stated in the query, but I believe he's probably, even though he's called a shofet, I think he is probably a Muslim judge because the author of the query states that the brother, Hashin Oto El Hashofet. The verb here, Hashin, means to inform upon someone um, to a non Jewish authority, or at least to my knowledge. When it's used in this medieval context, this is how it's used. So these two responsa show how conversion could be used by slaves in very different ways to force disintegration of themselves from the Jewish community or integration of themselves into the Jewish community. So it gives us another way to think about conversion. 
and it is a tactic or a strategy for people at the margins of society as a way to advance their own self-interests. So, in summary, I want to return to the idea of what conversion means in the context and what it means to study slaves as converts. So one of the, the benefits, I think, of studying slaves is it points the camera to the margins of society and allows us to see the dynamics of conversion on a non-elite group and in a group that's operating under a particular set of constraints that may differ from people with monetary means and with other social networks upon which they can rely. I also like to address the issue again or remind us about the trend toward conversion that is evident in the Geniza, but to say that we have to temper this conclusion by keeping in mind the way that the logic of source preservation may in fact sort of bias the picture that is preserved in the Cairo Geniza. But I do think there are structural factors at play in medieval Egypt, specific to the Jewish community of Egypt, that may be shared by other communities. But in Egypt, certainly the slave-master relationships do resemble wala, do resemble clientage. And I think this patron-client relationship persisted through manumission and is an integrative force that tended to encourage the integration of slaves through conversion into the community. I also think we need to say that in general there was a concern in the Egyptian Jewish community with the status of unmarried women who were viewed as intrinsic dependents, and I think slave girls who were manumitted fit into this general conception that it was the community's responsibility to provide for and watch out for unmarried dependents. Another point I'd like to add is that we also must consider the self-interest of the slave, which is never really explicitly stated in the sources, but which we can see through the two responses that I shared was certainly something that slaves were aware of and knew that they had options to use conversion in particular ways. We also see in the legal document in which Mubaraka is helped in finding a marital match, that she herself is a, a witting and willing party to this match. And so I think we need to consider that slave conversions could very were often done with the consent of the slave and were not necessarily coerced. Although I don't reject that there weren't coerced conversions, I have not found evidence of them in the documentary Geniza. I'd also like to take one step back and to think about how the study of slave conversion in Cairo, in Egypt, can allow us to see other kinds of issues. We have to recall that Jews are a minority within the Islamic empire, the other large minority group of course being Christians. Jews also had a custom of selling slaves to other Jews. They did sell slaves sometimes to Christians and to Muslims, but this was avoided when possible. But this restricted their market or was a self-restriction of the slave market. And I argue that slaves have fewer outlets for what to do with slaves when they no longer wish to retain a slave's services in the house, when they felt like they didn't need it. Slave concubinage in medieval Egypt was also illegal at this time. And it was, though it was a persistent social problem. So the presence of unmarried female slaves within the Jewish household posed the problem of proximity. And I think that we also can think of conversion as a solution, maybe not a witting solution, but as it did happen to meet these needs of what to do with slaves when you don't have an open market for selling slaves, and what to do in a situation where unmarried slave women represent a sexual temptation to Jewish men in the household in a context in which slave concubinage for Jews was illegal. Slavery in the medieval Jewish context in Cairo also had much more value as, a, as an expression of social prestige, or as much value as it did in terms of its own labor. So I'd like to look at, or put these as sort of tentative hypotheses about why we may see a trend, if it is real, towards the integration, the conversion and integration of, of freed slaves in medieval Cairo. Thanks. Our next speaker is Moshe Agu, who is a PhD candidate at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. He's studying the social history of Jewish communities in medieval Islam under the supervision of the Dr. Miriam Frankel. Okay, everybody, can everybody hear me? Yeah. 
Okay, thank you very much. Um, just a second. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak here today. In my paper today, I will present portraits of two proselytes who lived among the Jewish community in Fustat, Old Cairo, during the late 11th and the early 12th century. The two proselytes represent the two edges of the social spectrum of Jewish community at that time. One is an almost anonymous grave digger, the other a well-established public, public figure. Two reasons can be given for the importance of studying the details about them. First, thanks to the Cairo Geniza documents, we get a rare chance to uncover details about the daily lives of people who lived almost a millennium ago. Such an opportunity can give, us fa can give a face to conversion to Judaism <coughs> in Egypt during those times. Secondly, by investigating the lives of these two very different proselytes, we can try and reconstruct a larger picture, even if partial, of the social status of Jewish proselytes, Jewish attitudes towards conversion, the process of conversion, as well as the limitations of research in dealing with these subjects. The information that enables us to identify these proselytes and their uh, stories stems from the, from, uh, the document, documentary sources of uh, the Cairo Geniza. Uh, Craig has already uh, introduced some of them. Uh, so you saw how they look, and we'll get more pictures later. In these documents, we find references to converts to Judaism in dozens of documents, not including uh, freed persons. A detailed analysis of the information from these documents and from other contemporary sources, such as rabbinic responsa and halachic, theological, and historical compositions, might create a sufficient database that will allow us to draw some conclusions about the question of Jewish identity in the Islamicate world during the Middle Ages. This way we can shed some light on an understudied subject. But for now, let me first introduce to you the two proselytes. We will start with the grave digger. <coughs> the information we have about him comes from three charity lists written probably by community officials in charge of charity in ancient Fustat. The charity could be distributed in the form of money, wheat, bread, or clothing. The charity lists from the Geniza were first studied by Professor Shlomo Dov Goitain, the leading scholar of Geniza study, uh, Geniza society, and recently by his follower, Professor Mark Cohen. The first list contains the first list. Mm -hmm. Just a second. Okay, these are just a few pictures of Geniza. Okay, that's it. The first list contains only names. We don't know what exactly was given. We can know for certain that this is a charity list because some of the names occur in other lists as well, and some of the lists were written even by the same clerk. This uh, similarity also enables us to date this list to roughly around 1140. One of the names in the list is Ibrahim El Ger El Hafar, Ibrahim the proselyte grave digger. This, uh, these three words give us uh, the basic facts. There was a needy person, a needy proselyte in Fustat. His name was Abraham, and he was a grave digger, meaning from one of the lowest strata in the Jewish community. This information, as limited as it is, is already much more than we can say about many other persons uh, in this list. A second list bears the heading, a list of clothes for the poor, the year 1451, which corresponds to uh, about 1140. Every needy person in this list received a dress. Among them, we can see here, appears one Imra'at el Ger el Khafar, the wife of the proselyte gravedigger. So we learned that Ibrahim was married, um, and we don't know why his wife got uh, the dress in this case. The third list is the most interesting one. The list contains uh, about 100 names of needy persons and how much wheat should be given to each one. This list is also, is also from around 1140 in light of the recurring names. Uh, what is interesting in this specific list is that someone added notes referring to some uh, of the names. To some, a note was added, for example, saying Halaka, died. Uh, to others, gone or missing. About one of them, uh, a note was uh, added saying, note from the Rais, the head, this man should not receive anything. Next to, this, to some of the names, the note reads, doing well. One of these needy persons who was getting better, was doing well, is Alger <laughs> El Hafar, the proselyte grave, grave digger. It was written in the plural, plural, Le Aslachin, 
meaning probably him and his wife that we already met, or maybe his family. We know that this list is later than the, than the addresses list, the, since some of the persons from that list are already dead here. This way we can also know uh, that the proselyte uh, was doing well with his family sometime around or a little bit after 1140. So far, this is what we learn about our proselyte. His name was Abraham, he worked as a grave digger, he was married at least around 1140, and needed charity frequently. Later we will see if all this information is indeed verified. Let us move on to the second proselyte, the donor. In the Geniza, we find not only charity lists uh, of needy persons, but also lists of donors. A few of them mention na the name Abu al-Khair al-Ghir. Goitan has already noticed this uh, recurring name for proselytes in Geniza documents and wondered uh, whether Abu al-Khair, which he translated as Mr. Good, was a popular name for proselytes. But most of the documents mentioning this name are from the last two decades of uh, the 11th century, as I shall describe. Um, only only one debated document uh, was written probably around 1050. Therefore, I think that it is more reasonable to assume that there was uh, one wealthy proselyte named Abu al-Khair in Fustat in late 11th century who was active in the Jewish community than to assume that there were two, uh, two proselytes with the same, same name. So, three donor lists mention Abu al-Khair the proselyte uh, in the late 11th century. Many of the other donors in those lists um, are known to us from other sources to have been successful merchants, scholars, communal leaders, bankers, and government officials. In one of the lists, Abu al donates the highest sum, two dinars, it's approximately an uh, average uh, monthly salary, and it is exactly as another person who donates in the same list, which um, he is called El Tif Eret, the pride of the community. It seems then that Abu al was wealthy enough to donate considerable sums and was approached frequently by the community charity clerics, like other members of the community elite. His impressive status is, is attested also in the deathbed uh, declaration of one of the grandees of the Jewish Karaite community in Fustat, um, Moshe HaKohen ben Aharon. This Moshe was known to his contemporaries as Hassar HaAdil, the mighty prince and ruler of the age, which shows that he was a high official in the Fatimid administration. He was also bearing the name, uh, the title Sani Daula, the exalted one of the realm. In the Ktuba of his daughter uh, from uh, 1082, he was styled His Honor, Greatness, Holiness, Our Master, Our Teacher, Our Lord, Our Leader, Moshe Kohen, Banner of the Jews and the Strength and Joy of Their Glory. So when this Moshe was on his deathbed in 1085, he called some witnesses and testified in their presence that uh, he is handing the execution of his will to Abu El Sheikh Abu Al Khair Al Ghir, who was also present. Abu Al Khair was to sell some merchandise owned by Moshe, to sell the house furnishings for the sum of at least 145 dinars, to settle different debts of this mighty prince and of others, and to compensate the mighty prince's wife, who was also present. The testator emphasized that Abu Al Khair should be trusted like two kosher witnesses in dealing with his money. In a later court record, the widow releases the same Abu al-Khair al -Ghar from any further <laughs> obligations, which shows that this will was perfectly executed. This testimony shows that Abu al-Khair was not just a donor and respected member of the community, but was also considered a discreet associate to be relied on in the most delicate, um, delicate personal matters of a figure like Banner of the Jews and the strength of joy of their thanks and joy of their glory. This banner of the Jews, Moshe Kohen ben Aaron, married his daughter to David ben Daniel, son of Gaon Daniel ben Azariah, a descendant of the house of David. David ben Daniel arrived uh, to, at Egypt around 1080 and quickly became known as the leader of Egyptian Jewry, overthrowing the former Nagid and claiming the title head of all diaspora. David ben Daniel was supported by the elite of the Jewish communities in Egypt. One of his first steps when he arrived uh, in Fustat was to marry into one of the important local families, that of the same mighty prince, a banner of the Jews. This happened in 1082. The next obstacle to be dealt with was the current leader of Egyptian Jewry, the Nagid, Mevorach ben Saadia. Someone had to remove him. According to the scroll of Eviatar, the person that informed the government on Mevorach in order to get rid of him and eventually led him to uh, flee to Fayum in Upper Egypt was Ben El Khair El Ger. 
the, perhaps the son of our uh, Abu al-Khair, the proselyte, or maybe Abu al-Khair himself. And maybe Amir will talk about it uh, later. Or maybe not. Um, <laughs> the fact that uh, it was a proselyte uh, chosen to use his contacts with the government in order to remove the Nagid from duty should not be underestimated. Of course, it couldn't be just any person, but someone respected, connected, and wealthy, someone like Abu al-Khair. We have another testimony that Abu al-Khair had the right connections to perform such duties and that he didn't hesitate to use them. A court deposition dated from Hanukkah, December 1081, reveals a chain of events that started during Shabbat services in the Babylonian synagogue in Fustat. The witnesses who signed the deposition testified that someone tried to excommunicate Abu al-Khair al-Ger and his brother-in-law. At the end of the services, Abu al-Khair entered the synagogue, opened the ark, took out the Torah scroll, and declared a counterban on anyone that banned him. The witnesses further say that a person named Yehuda ben Chaim wasn't at all involved in the ban against Abu al-Khair, nor did he hit Abu al-Khair outside later during a discussion outside the synagogue. Nonetheless, the same very night, between Saturday and Sunday, policemen came from Cairo to Fustat and arrested Yudab ben Chaim and others, um, and others who were later tortured, beaten publicly in Cairo and in front of the gates of the synagogue in Fustat, and had to pay an enormous fine. This one uh, cited testimony shows that Abu al-Khar was not without enemies in the Jewish community, but it also shows that he was informed about uh, immediately about the ban, and that he was not afraid to use his religious uh, the religious tool of a ban in a synagogue, and the worldly tool of good connections with the Fatimid administration in Cairo. Abu al-Khar felt that his position in the in the community was strong enough for him to arrange for the arrest and public humiliation of other members of the Jewish community, and he was probably right. This incident happened in 1081. In 1082, he was involved in the removal of the Nagid. In 1085, he, we saw him executing the last will of one of the Jewish grandees, and later he was still donating considerable sums to public charity. We can also say a few words about Abu al-Khar's son, Zayn. Zayn is mentioned in four private, uh, Geniza letter, uh, private letters from the Geniza, all dealing in long-distance trade. The persons mentioned in those letters are known to us from other uh, documents to have been successful merchants trading between Spain, North Africa, Yemen, and India. Some of them appear on the donors list with Zayn's father, Abu al-Khair. In one letter, the writer, asks, um, the writer asks the addressee to deliver to Zayn 40 kilograms of cedar raisin used for, uh, used for dyeing, perfumes, and medicines. Uh, as soon as he reads the letter, here you can see him, Zayn ben Abu al-Khair al um, In another letter addressed to one of the first Jewish traders uh, with India, the writer reports about products sent to the addressee with Zayn. Other traders mentioned in these letters are also from the elite of the Jewish mer Mediterranean merchants in the early decades of the 12th century. In all the letters, Zayn is known as ben al-Khair al, -Khair al Another hint to the high status of his father, Abu al-Khair, the proselyte. So Zayn, just like his father, was wealthy, well-connected, and known, and was part of this close elite of merchants and communal leaders. Only one fact seems to inconsistent with uh, this uh, reconstruction. The name Zayn ben al appears in the same interesting charity list that we discussed earlier. You see Zayn ben al -Ger. On the other side of the same page that mentions al ger al-Hafar, uh, appears Zayn ben al -Ger receiving about 20 kilograms of wheat, a little less than the grave digger who receives 30 kilograms. But Zayn certainly wasn't a needy person. In these kinds of lists, communal officials who were also entitled uh, to some payment from the community appear side by side with the needy receiving money, wheat, or clothes. For example, in this very list appear two Parnassim, Hiba, Hiba and Ibrahim, who also received wheat. So we can only assume that Zayn, who around 1140 was already quite old, received public support for a certain service to the community. Now, after we have sketched uh, what we know about uh, the lives of these two very different proselytes, we can try and understand what we can learn from their personal lives about the conditions of proselytes in general in the Jewish society in Egypt at that time. I would like to address 
a number of issues. First of all, a general remark about the fragmented and biased nature of information gathered from Geniza documents. Then I want to discuss briefly the previous religious identity of proselytes, how proselytes are identified by the Jewish community, the circumstances that led some of them to appeal for charity, and finally one aspect of personal Hebrew names of proselytes. We know almost nothing about Ibrahim, the proselyte gravedigger. The anonymous clerk who wrote this charity list could have called him only the proselyte, as he did with others. Luckily for us, he added other identifying details, such as his name, his profession, and even mentioned his wife in one document. We should always keep in mind that, like Ibrahim, we have dozens of other documents mentioning proselytes by the term proselyte alone, of whom we know nothing about. Just how scanty our information is can be, can be seen from examining the grave, grave digger's name that appears in only one of the three lists. I, um, I said that I, the grave digger's name was Abraham, but Professor Mark Cohen believes that his name was Joseph from Tripoli. Uh, it is a simple question of how one reads the lines in the document. Okay? Uh, should it be read Ibrahim? Sorry, should it be read Ibrahim, the proselyte grave digger, Joseph from Tripoli, the blind, or maybe Ibrahim, the proselyte grave digger, Joseph from Tripoli, the blind? In my opinion, the first option is much more reasonable. In any case, it is clear that it is the same name, uh, the same proselyte grave digger uh, from the other two lists. But it is interesting to note that even the first name of this proselyte that we are dealing with is not beyond doubt. Despite the fragmentary nature of the information uh, at our disposal, the gravedigger and, and the donor are not unique cases. Like the gravedigger, we know of other proselytes on charity lists. In the same list where we found the gravedigger's wife receiving a dress, we also find another, uh, Ibrahim al -Ger. On the latest list of, this, of the three discussed, this Ibrahim is said to be missing. Um, we, what happened to this uh, Ibrahim, the other proselyte, we do not know. The same clerk who wrote uh, this uh, list and the dresses list also wrote other lists as well. In one of them we find the proselytes in the Babylonian synagogue, El Gerfi Kanisa El Irakiim. Other proselytes in other lists are mentioned um, only as Ger or Gioret, here for example Gioret, and sometimes we get a little bit more information, the proselyte from Cairo, for example, here. Uh, but proselytes were not all needy. Abu al-Khar certainly wasn't the only well-to-do proselyte in Fustat in that period. A letter sent, sent to a certain Sayyiduna, our master, describes how when Yosef Ger HaTzedek, the righteous proselyte, arrived in Malij, at Malij in the Delta, the community of Malij welcomed him with all due respect. It seems that this Joseph had good ties with the anonymous uh, master. In Malij, he was trading in different books of Jewish literature. In the early 13th century, a person who lost his fortune writes to one of the leaders of the community of Alexandria. He requests that he be allowed to join a Sheikh al Ajal Ibrahim al Ger, the Honorable Elder Ibrahim the Proselyte, who will be going on a journey to Sueta in Morocco. We know also of proselytes donating to charity lists beside Abu al Ger, but unfortunately nothing else can be added about them. It is clear then that although we cannot reconstruct the exact status of proselytes in the Jewish community of 12th century Fustat, we can definitely say that the grave digger and the donor can tell us something about the situation of other proselytes. We will never have the full picture, but few glimpses will suffice. Why did uh, some proselytes need help from the community? It is clear why refugees or captives are mentioned as such in charity lists. A point, it is a point to be made that um, proselytes probably received charity not because they were proselytes, but because they were poor. This can be seen not only from the way the charity lists are edited, mixing indiscriminately widows, refugees, orphans, community clerks, and proselytes, but also from personal letters of proselytes appealing directly to rich individuals uh, in request for support. In these letters, the proselytes do not fail to mention their identity, and they add the appropriate verses from the Bible and the sages ruling about the importance of helping the girl. But even in these letters, the main reason presented in request for support is a specific economic distress. Uh, usually the fact that the writer is alone with no one else to turn to in this foreign land. 
The motif of alienness and wanderings is extant in many charity request letters of other needy persons who were not proselytes. So Ibrahim, the proselyte grave digger, like other proselytes, wasn't perceived as entitled to charity by the mere fact that he was a proselyte, uh, that he converted to Judaism, but by his individual difficult economic situation, which, as we have seen, even might have got better at a certain point. Of course, once a proselyte needed charity, he could use the fact that he was a proselyte to his advance. The term the proselyte in itself should also be addressed. It seems that there was no added value, positive or negative, to the term, at least in these lists. And it functioned as a mere descriptive, descriptive term, like saying the blind or from Tripoli. If we had, if we had only the court deposition about the events uh, concerning the ban against Abu al-Khar, the proselyte, in the synagogue, we could have assumed that his enemies wanted to remind everyone that he was Ger, a foreign, not an original part of the community. But thanks to the other documents found, we, we know that he was always known, called as the proselyte, in formal court records, in practical charity lists, and even in his son's nickname decades later. Therefore, we can conclude that the proselyte was merely a practical way of identification. Just a second. We have no clue as to the gravediggers and the donors' former religion. This is probably no coincidence, since it is true of most of the proselytes in the Geniza. Not only in the short and uh, practical charity lists, but also in other longer documents. In some cases, we know uh, the proselytes came from Bala de Rum, which means a Christian origin, either Byzantium or Western Europe. But also born Jews from there would be called Erumi or from Bala de Rum. In fact, explicit information about proselytes' former religion comes only from polemical uh, paragraphs, like parts of the scroll of Ovadia Hager, or another proselyte from the early 11th century, who is said to argue with the Gentiles, meaning Christians, as opposed to uh, Goim, meaning Muslims. Interestingly enough, we can recall a few cases where proselytes could have mentioned their former religion, but did not probably a deliberate choice. The same uh, Ovadia who wrote at length about his Christian origin in his scroll received a letter of recommendation from Rabbi Baruch Ben Yitzchak, the leader of the Jewish community of Halab. In this letter, uh, the rabbi fails to mention anything about Ovadia's former religion, not even the terms such as Gentiles, Edomites, idol worshippers, and such. This is the same in a letter written in Judeo-Arabic on behalf of an elderly woman uh, from Upper Egypt who writes to the Nagid about her wish to become Jewish. Another letter of recommendation was given to a poor female proselyte who had to run away from her, fa from her original family her Jewish husband was later killed in anti-Jewish riots, and her son and daughter were taken captive. The letter was given to her in order to help her collect a sufficient sum for ransoming her children. We know this proselyte was probably originally Christian, since the cities of Norborn and Munio are mentioned, but nowhere in the letter itself uh, does the writer mention any definite Christian term. This cannot be a coincidence, uh, in my view. It seems that in most cases, the proselytes and the Jewish community chose to leave the past behind, to see the proselyte as a newly born, uh, as a newly born, and even uh, this phrase it in itself erases the past. It's not it it's It wasn't goy. We don't talk about this. Um, last but not least, I would like to touch another topic personal Hebrew names given to proselytes, either chosen by the proselytes themselves or given to them by others. Um, <coughs> the name of the proselyte gravedigger Abraham is interesting. It is a well-known custom to call proselytes Ben Abraham. This can be found uh, also um, in Geniza documents uh, in a prenuptial agreement concerning the, uh, the wedding gifts, the groom is Ovadia uh, Ben Elazar and the bride Mubaraka Bat Avraham Gioret. Um, this custom is not mentioned uh, as obligatory in halachic literature of our period, but we have testimonies from, for, for it from 12th century Europe. Uh, we already talked about Abraham Ben Avraham Avinu. And here we can present an example from the Geniza, and th thus far this is the only one that I know from the Geniza. Later this custom became more important, to the point that some halachic figures thought that a wedding agreement or a bill of divorce 
sorry, excuse me, a renemy or a bill of divorce that didn't mention that the poet was son of Avraham or even son of Avraham Avinu, Gert Tzedek, was not valid. The idea at the core of this custom is, of course, the notion found in Jewish literature already in late Second Temple period and later in classical rabbinic literature that Abraham was a proselyte or a model for all proselytes or even an active missionary. However, this notion was not accepted among all different schools in Judaism, and as uh, Moshe Lavi has recently shown, the Babylonian Talmud purposefully narrows the validity of such concepts. If the image of Abraham, the forefather, as a proselyte and a conversion model was under dispute, we can understand why Maimonides paid so much effort in his response to Ovadia Hagel. Um, <coughs> To Ovadia. Ovadia asked whether he can say in his prayer, our fathers. And Maimonides went a long way to show that Abraham is the father of all proselytes, and therefore proselytes uh, are equal in status to born Jews. Maimonides wrote, whoever adopts Judaism and confesses the unity of the divine name, as it is prescribed in the Torah, is counted among the disciples of Abraham, our father, peace be with him. In the same way as he converted his contemporaries through his words and teachings, he converts future generations through the testament he left to his children and household after him. Thus Abraham, our father, peace be with him, is the father of his pious posterity who keep his ways, and the father of his disciples and of all proselytes who adopt Judaism. Maimonides' rhetoric efforts to equate the status of proselytes and born Jews were probably part of a heated discussion in that period, as this and other sources show. In this, if, in this situation, it is certainly important that the gravedigger chose to be called Abraham. The gravedigger was not alone. So far, I have gathered Hebrew names of 20 different uh, proselytes in Geniza documents. Five of the 20 are named Abraham. Uh, Abraham is the most common name of proselytes found thus far in Geniza. Surely the Hebrew name chosen in the ceremony of conversion uh, represents the proselytes' notions and his message to his new Jewish society. In conclusion, references to proselytes can be found in more than 60 Geniza documents. Many of these references do not give us much information beyond the existence of an anonymous proselyte in a charity list or a private letter. But from some of the documents we can learn a little more, not only about the individual proselyte mentioned in them, but also about other anonymous and forgotten ones. In this paper I try to reconstruct what we can about the lives of two proselytes from the two far edges of the Jewish community of Fustat around the year 1100. A poor grave digger named Abraham and a rich and influential donor and his son. These two remote examples form the basis for a short discussion about some aspects of conversion to Judaism in 12th century Egypt. We learn that we know almost nothing about the previous lives of the proselytes, and this is probably intended. We discuss the significance of the personal name Abraham for proselytes, and the social meaning of the nickname the proselyte. No doubt this is, uh, these were only preliminary notes, but hopefully they will form part of further research about conver conversion in the Jewish society in Muslim lands during the Middle Ages. Who converted and why? What was the exact procedure of conversion, the integration of proselytes into Jewish society, and other issues? This kind of research might teach us not only about conversion, whatever that is, but also about the way the Jewish society defined itself, its identity, and the ways to change identity. Thank you very much. Our respondent will be Amir Ashur, who is a senior research associate at the center, and his main field of research is Cairo Gniza. Amir? Hi, um, uh, can you hear me? Everything is, is it okay? Yeah. Now it's okay. Oh, okay. Okay, so I, I'll, I'll take this op op opportunity for to, uh, to discuss two things, it, it will be short, don't worry. If first, I, I would like to add some, some a, a, a nice story that can add to a Craig Perry's uh, um, a discussion. Then I, I would like to talk briefly 
about the carrogen is as a source for study of, of conversion. So first, uh, Greg Perry uh, spoke about uh, um, a convert, converted uh, conversion of slaves. There is a very famous and, and a nice story of it that took place in, in, in India. A man, a, 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 a Jewish trader called, a, a, called Abraham Ibn Iju, who, who was a, a Tunisian a, a merchant, a, arrived to, to the west coast of, 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 of India in around 1132. And, and when he a, arrived there as, as a merchant, he, he, he fell in, in, in love with the country. And, and he, he, he stayed there, he, he, he decided to, to do his, his business while he is there. But there is a, a problem, he is a Jew, a young Jew, and unmarried. Where can you find a Jewish girl in India in 1132? So he, being a scholar, he, he knew that he, he can convert as a slave girl. So he went uh, down to the slave market and he looked around and he, f and he find this most beautiful uh, slave girl, Indian slave girl, called, called Al Ashu. Ashu or, or Ashwar, I don't know Hindi, so I don't. Um, and he bought her f from her master, and he m m a f f freed her, and he gave her an, a new name, Beracha. It's like Mubaraka, Beracha Bat Avram. Also, and he married her, and as. And, and later on, they lived. They live in, 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 in India for 20 years. They, they had kids. They went back. I, 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 I won't tell all this story. It's, it's a, a, this story can be found in in Goitain and Friedman's uh, India to traders in medieval uh, period, and, and also in the Hebrew in the Sefer Odu, a chap, a book. Three. But when they came back to Cairo, uh, his daughter, the daughter of him and, and, and his former slave girl, got married to a very highly of, of, of official, to Perachia Hadayan, who was a judge in Maimonides' own court. So you see how, how it, uh, they are assimilated into the Jewish uh, community without any, any problem. Now, um, um, regarding the Karo as, as a source, we heard here to, uh, two wonderful talks that make use of, of, of the, of the um, legal and, and uh, documentary sources in the Karo Gen but the current this has huge amount of, of other materials that can be used. Uh, first, we heard about uh, conversions of people into Judaism. We have data of, of, of the other way around. People that converted to Islam, Christianity and so on. The Karaganiza, if, if you don't know, it contains around 300,000 shelf marks, which is about quarter and a million pages. In a, in a, and, it's all, and it's scattered all around in, in many different libraries, so we don't really have a complete catalog. So in, 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 in order to search for uh, documents or, or other material uh, uh, dealing with confession, we have to go through all, almost all of the collection. Now we have legal documents, we have letters, we have polemics, a huge amount of, of polemic literature. 
we have literary, literary sources like like a, a, a story of Muhammad or story of, of, of Jesus that also are, are polemical and, and, and deals with conversion. We have a, a halachic sources, unknown a geonic responsa, unknown geonic and a, a halachic books that deals with this subject. So there is a huge task, and, and I, I, I want personally to thank Chaim and, and the center for giving me the opportunity to start this uh, uh, task, which I, I, I hope next next conference I, I will be able to say something about it. So um, many thanks. general pattern of classifying individuals in the Ganesha society by their social position, uh, such as Almana, or the Ishto Shel HaMoreshet HaMoreh, the widow or the wife of the uh, teacher. Um, and uh, we have or classifying them by their roles in the community, a chazan, a shochet, and so forth. Um, and perhaps the, the story is bigger than the actual matter of proselytes and slaves as far as naming and classifications are concerned. And what intrigues me is what does it tell us about this society that chooses when it puts down names of people, when it addresses individuals in its text to classify their social, occupational, marital, and so forth positions, what does it tell us about the society? What role do, do these classifications have and title giving, uh, what role uh, does it play in that society? Is it a matter of stratification? Is it a matter of, of, of does it play, does it, uh, fulfill some kind of ritualistic role, uh, entry or exclusion of individuals in various circles of the, uh, daily or uh, holy uh, lives or affairs. So this is, I'm not sure this is something we'd be able to address, but since you are looking at these names and you're putting a focus in your research on, the, on these questions, perhaps there is something more than just the issue of, of conversion here. There's something bigger about the society that is choosing to classify people. So if you want to address it, that'd be great. But... Thank you. Uh, great question, Ariel. Thank you. And well, I'll speak about slaves being say, identified as or free, uh, the free person of so and so. And, I think it's interesting that, so I think it does fit into what you're suggesting and that the tie between a, a master and his former slave is a relevant one, a salient one. So it functions to indicate uh, practical relationships that exist between people that have meaning because they're used in a certain way or that they are expected to be used in a certain way. So uh, that would make it equivalent to calling someone the, the wife of so-and-so or so it is a kind of um, not a, a, a real kinship you know, relationship but a, a sort of a more do sense like a practical kinship relationship to call someone the, the the freed slave of so-and-so and, -so. and uh, 
Oh, I don't want to speak about or Do you want to speak about Gare as an yeah. Yeah. OK, thank you. Thank you for the question. So I'm, I'm not sure, I, like you said, I'm not sure I can say anything uh, at the moment, too much at the moment. But I think that um, from these lists, at, at, la at least, um, so you see the wife off and the daughter off and, uh, and the orphans off and the Polnas and the girl, but also you see the blind and the redhead and the guy from Tripoli, which m might not be from Tripoli, is, is his grandfather. So is it a stratification of society or is it just uh, an easy way for the for the Parnas, for the Shamash, to give the money. Okay, he goes around the, the alleys and he needs to give the money to the right persons. So if the, the redhead could also be a proselyte, but we don't know. And, and he, we come 900 years later and we build this database and we look for proselytes. Okay, but we don't know what, who else was a proselyte. Uh, but four years from now, maybe I'll know better. Okay. And no, you're right. I agree. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for uh, those uh, uh, fascinating. I, I wanted to ask a number of questions. First of all, uh, um, you said that they don't talk about. You mentioned they don't talk about their previous uh, conversion. Mm -hmm. and so you talk about the fact that they don't. You don't. They don't mention their previous. Their previous or where, what they converted from. But surely we must be talking. We can't be talking so much about conversion from Islam. Because that would have been very, that would have been a very uh, uh, dangerous thing to do. So presumably, most of the converts are from uh, Christianity, or well, I don't know about paganism, but Christ, but, Christ, but uh, at least uh, uh, with a Christian background. That's one question. The second question has, is, is a more broader one. It has to do trying to connect the, our last two sessions, the session before and uh, 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 and this session. If in the last session we talked about uh, uh, what Roy Flechner talked about, a, no, a normative uh, uh, text, uh, well, most of the texts here are haphazard and not very uh, uh, normative in the sense that they're piecemeal and, and whatever else. But how do what you see in these piecemeal texts relate to the normative texts that we know that were around? Uh, uh, right? Where is the, Gon the Gonic Responso, the uh, Halachic uh, uh, um, Compendia? Right. How, do, how does what happened in reality, according to the documents that you have, right, relate to uh, uh, the uh, normative uh, text? I will take this first. Um, so yes, yeah, supposedly they couldn't be converting from Islam, but uh, also supposedly you sh in, under Islam you can't convert also from Christianity to Judaism. It's also, an, you can convert only to, the, to Islam, uh, but we know of we have examples of, uh, I don't know, at least two, which is a lot, uh, local Christians who converted to Islam, to, who converted to Judaism. I think that al also um, converting the slaves, I think it's also, at least to some opinions, uh, formally it's not allowed, I think. I don't know, maybe. probably you know about it more. So, yes, we have uh, testimonies that some of the projects came from Europe, uh, that we know of certainly, but I wouldn't rule out the possibility that, you know, exactly as you converted from Judaism to Islam and went to another place and then came back to Judaism, so you also have been to Morocco and decided to convert to Judaism, so you moved to Egypt. Who will know? I don't, I don't know. I don't rule, rule it out. Um, great. <coughs> well, um, so slave women in the Goy time first observed this and it's held to be true that most slave women documented in the Gideas are are from Nubia, which was a Christian kingdom during this time, or they're described as black, just um, or from Sudan. So, and those, over time, those get conflated. So, black could mean Nubian. Um, so that you know, the, but we don't always know if, if a specific slave who was converted or married what her previous background was. Um, but yeah, when religion is identified related to slaves, it is invariably in the documentary sources I've seen Christian I haven't seen other religion uh, religions noted um, now of course if it's an Indian slave you might presume a Hindu tradition is uh, the basis or, or the religious possibility normative texts and uh, what I would call you know maybe a better dichotomy to false dichotomy to set up would be you know prescriptive and descriptive texts so if normative texts are prescriptive uh, documents such as a Geniza source could be descriptive. 
So here's um, something interesting, and actually I'd be um, interested to speak more with uh, Ephraim with you about this. Like so, in the response that I spoke about at the end, where the this post of Maimonides, you know, what do we do in the situation where the slave girl pretends basically to be Jewish or says she's Jewish? Um, but my mom, you know, he says the solution is better, he should marry her, essentially, is the, what should happen? Well, according to, according to Jewish law, if a man has sexual relationships with his slave woman, he's forbidden to marry her. That's illegal. He needs to sell her. He's punished for that. But so there is a sort of an accommodationist stance or permitting where Maimonides is looking to do the lesser of the evils, which is a way to... Um, remedy the situation is for this Jewish man to, to marry his slave girl. So, and then what we see also in the in descriptive texts in the Geniza that this is not an isolated problem. That Jewish men take slave girls um, and they use them as concubines, and this does create domestic strife. So I think we can do a kind of triangulation between prescriptive sources and descriptive sources that en enlarges our picture of what's happening. I, I also I rely often on the, the queries. Part of the query, part of the response, and this is the question sent. And that's not um, without its problems and pitfalls, but I think it suggests sometimes a specific situation, you can kind of tell from the way it's written that this is not just a hypothetical that's being sent to elicit a response. Um, but it, at the very least, it kind of creates a world of what was socially plausible or expected to happen between masters and slaves, for, for example. And so to read fragmented evidence that we both presented against this larger field of social plausibility is another way, I think, to productively use prescriptive and descriptive sources together. Uh, so I also wanted to piggyback on Ryan's question um, about this leaving the past behind because this really fascinated me. Um, I've had this impression about other discussions of conversion to Judaism. That, uh, there is kind of and you're trying to form a pattern or something, that there is less interest in the past. Um, that is, when converts are talked about, if at all, there's really not an obsession with what happened before they converted and how much, how great their sin was and how far they were off the path. They just were not, you know, Jewish, and then they became Jewish. So there's, and I'm wondering if this can be connected in any way, this is what I wanted to do, but if it could be connected with the fact that there's very little long descriptions of conversion, like the one we have with Obadja, which seems totally unique. That is, these kind of drawn out stories or narratives. Usually we have brief, you know, statement of fact without, and if there's any story, it, it seems to come after the fact. The circumstances after conversion. Um, do you think that's right? It, can we connect those two things? That there's kind of, for, for whatever reason, maybe a theological reason or the fact that converts play no particular theological role uh, for everybody else in Judaism, that they're not interested in talking about their past life before conversion, that, that this gives rise to the form of the text in a certain way. You don't elaborate on that before and after, and there's no kind of, obviously no prefiguration or something. Uh, do you think that that's, does that ring true with the cases you look at? I mean, most of these seem so telegraphic. Um, yeah. Is there a reason for that? Yeah, so I totally agree that we have, like, if we have this Ovadia scroll or the, this proselyte that uh, tells how he wrote pamphlets and sent them to the priest, and so then we know that he was Christian. Uh, and you're right that we have, don't have, besides of these two or another one, we don't have anything else. But I think, for example, these uh, private appeals for request, when the, the proselyte does give his story, and, in, and I think we have, like, I don't know, five to ten le different letters like this, and none of them says, you know, he could have said, uh, please help me, you see, I'm so worthy because I was an idol worshiper, and now I, I, I've seen the light, okay? Uh, but, it, but he doesn't say, he say, please help me, I'm alone, I have nowhere else to go but you. So why didn't he say that? And I think maybe we can connect it also to, to queries um, about the other way. Um, um, if you leave Judaism to another religion, yes, you're called Meshumad or Poshea or Yatsam in Aklal or Dachalam in Din, but it never states to which Din. I mean, it doesn't matter. Okay, you became a Christian or idol worshiper, you became Muslim, it doesn't matter. Okay, even in, in queries that, and then uh, Abraham Maimonides has to 
has to reply in the response. If you meant an apostate to Islam, so the answer is this. If you meant an apostate to Christianity, it's this. He doesn't know, it, and it seems like nobody cares. You're with us or without us? You were not part of us, doesn't matter, now you're with us. Forget about the past. This is what I think at the moment. I, I just want to address that quickly. I, I would, I, I wanted to ask too, but does that say something about what a kind of normative conversion was or more representative types of conversions? I don't know if in creating the database we need to think about like typologies of conversion as a fiction we create in order to make class, classifications that could be useful to researchers. Um, but for example, does the lack of narrativized conversion stories indicate a pragmatic relationship between converts and and religious identification and an accept, and sort of an expectation on the part of community that people make choices to join the Jewish community for very practical or basic reasons and that that's also a kind of conversion. I also just want to flag, um, and this is just occurring to me, when the Fatimid Caliphate, which is the sources that Moshe and I mentioned, I think most of them all fell, well most of them fell before 1171, the Fatimids were a minority Shiite ruler over a majority Sunni population. So I think also, I would like they didn't have dreams that everyone's going to become Shiite in uh, creed in Egypt. They did want to become the universal caliphate in terms of their rule over the Islamic world, but I don't think they had uh, you know, any kind of idea that everyone would become Shiite. So I also wonder how this makes conversion received and understood in this sort of bigger imperial context, um, which I think is a, a, something we could leave on the table for this particular context and conversion. Following what you said yesterday, you differentiate between conversion in different contexts, places, so if we move to the early modern period, we do hear a lot about what they call the key prior to the conversion, and as I think, uh, try to show uh, in the next session, we do hear about the life stories, from that in the early modern period, and I'm sure that there are other you know, periods and, and, and places where we will hear about the context of the bank one, the front one, and not only what happened after the I'm talking mainly about the truth of the word of but uh, yeah. Well, that was what I was thinking, it's a Christian trope, yeah. this obsession with the past. Mm -hmm. I see a head with your fault, Kai. I'm interested in is the routes taken by these converts, especially those who come from Christian Europe, to reach Egypt and the Muslim countries. Because it represents some uh, practical difficulty. I mean, which, uh, which ships or vessels do they travel on? Muslim ones or Christian ones? Uh, I just give uh, one example, which uh, Amir knows perfectly well. The, the girl who came on the ship from Kappa to Sicily, which is mentioned in the Giza. So this one, we know how we take it through. <coughs> About Obadia, again, of course we know because he tells his whole story and also how he had to run away from his persecutors and so on. But uh, it would be very interesting to try, to try and trace the origins of this uh, convert, even if we can do uh, specific cases, specific events, but at least to trace the roots. Uh, as far as we can, maybe by using other sources and, as well, it might give us a better picture of what's happening in this period. Thank you. Yeah. Um, just to react to some of the things that are being said, um, as far as the issue, and I don't know, Yaakov, will hear what kinds of sources you're talking about, it seems that on what I would call a public policy Jewish communal issue, certainly in any kind of rabbinic or halacha context, there is the issue of not remembering too much about where the proselyte is from as a matter of embarrassment. In fact, there, there's even a prohibition of sort of bringing it up to him. So you get into an interesting calculus to call him a ger or her a ger or a yoret, that's okay because that's what they are and that affects their halachic status and all of that, who they can marry. But to go into the details, so obviously charity lists are not legal documents, but they are a public context. So the more you add details, I think that might be an issue here. And again, I, you know, Yaakov will tell us where his sources are. So obviously if the person 
uses it illustratively, that's fine. And, and there may be contexts where it's very important, and there may be, may be types of literature that do that. But the more communal you get, and towards the rabbinic or the halachic, I suspect there's going to be a diminution. And that might explain this. Uh, the, the issue that you raise about the, the uh, you know, maidservants, about the shifak, and I think it's very interesting here. First of all, there's the whole problem of the conversion of the servant before they become a real Shifcha Kanani, which you know, obviously didn't address much, didn't have to, but so there's an ongoing conversion process here, and I don't know how the database is going to go. What will they do with an Evid Kanani or Shifcha Kanani, the Canaanite slave? Because, again, technically there is a halachic vehicle by which they are, uh, I'm going to say half converted, because you know, Brian will go wild here, because we, we have no term for it even in halacha. Mm -hmm. You know, just it's, it's, it's a something. And so the marriage coming out then leads, you know, when they are manumitted, there's then a completed conversion. And there becomes a remarkable debate among the halachists, where Maimonides holds, I'm sure you know, that, and this goes you know, east to west, Maimonides holds that the slave who's coming out of uh, uh, you know, the status of Canaanite slavery, or slavehood, whatever it's called, has to be immersed according to Torah law, and that until that immersion happens, it's, nothing is, is complete. Whereas most other medieval authorities, certainly in the West, hold that that additional uh, immersion is, you know, for it's a rabbinic kind of a decree. So there's a lot there about the finalization, the finalizing of that conversion. And just a final point about the, uh, you know, what you would specifically be talking about. There is a fascinating uh, Mishnah in, in Tractate Kiddushin where um, the Mishnah seems to assert that if a, um, a mamzer, a, a Jew who's a, a male who's a mamzer uh, uh, marries a shivcha kenanit, and they have a child. That child will be, will you can lose the taint of mamzerut. It's really the only way that mamzerut can be eliminated. And so there's a subsequent passage where the Talmud talks about <laughs> silver and gold purifying mamzerim. So one interpretation is it's cute. Um, somebody says they're a mamzer. They have a lot of money. People will marry them anyway. And the other interpretation is if you've got a bunch of money, invest in a Canaanite slave woman and you will, you know, solve your mom's a root problem. So, so your point about whether this is a great relationship to begin with, but it has some power here uh, according to Jewish law. So there's a lot, of, a lot of stuff there for you to think about. We can talk more. Thank you. <laughs> I just wanted to make a, a small sort of point in answer to Uriah's question, where I don't necessarily agree with Moshe, uh, that it's just a, sort of a description, that, you know, it's, oh, it's like redheaded, it's, it's just to identify him. And this is a society that is very much concerned with distinction and with hierarchy. And I'll just give one sort of example that Amir might correct me if I'm getting it wrong, but a sort of a marriage agreement after a sort of a, a marital dispute where the wife agrees that she will not mention the parents of the uh, of her husband without the proper titles. So just as an example of of just how much title is important in the society, not just as identification. Yeah. I, <laughs> if I, I remember correct, I don't remember. Translated it differently that she, she, she won't call call him in name. So oh, yeah, okay, okay. Well, but you can yeah. Okay. But titles are very important. Yes, tit titles are, but but I, I I think in this case um, Moshe is is right, and and Gare or or redheaded or or the the blind man is is, is just way to to say to distinguish between the different people. Yeah. But no question. Very short remark. You inspire that when you say that the state is obsessed with the past. First of all, there is the notion of the new thing that already brings you back to the past. Then, of course, the state tries to control the internal form. So you can see the thoughts, such feelings. So probably, they have the necessity to know the past and the convert in order to eradicate the new problems. 
as far as I know, uh, the Muslim position is uh, very different. I would say in uh, the Iranian sources, the North African sources in the 16th, 17th century, uh, make it clear that, uh, what can I say, um, renegades, conversion of former Christians, mistaken, mistaken face value, but nobody was going to bet that internally they had become Muslims. So they were still Muslims until, say, they wouldn't move to the Muslim. And you find it in, uh, you say, Persian uh, uh, sources, administrative sources. I was really, I read two days ago, I was really, an article about uh, converts in North Africa and uh, the Muslim uh, apologist uh, put it very clear. Uh, he said, we can't, uh, can't and we don't want to control the internal form of the running. As long as they pay five times a day and they don't cause trouble, so, um, more than this we and maybe the Jewish position was closer to the, to the Muslim position. But my question, if you line these up, comparing these kinds of paradigms of conversion that you just mentioned, the, the idea of the role of the past in creating the definition of the present faith of the conversion. If there's absolutely no role for whatever other religion, if they're all the same in the, the notion of, of what faith is supposed to be, you can either have faith or not have faith, you're part of the community or you're not part of the community. Here, it doesn't matter what you were, uh, but it leads up to, it gives way in a supersession of way to Islam. But who cares how you know, far off that path you were? Whereas in Christianity, it's constantly reinforcing the meaning of your present faith. You were so bad, the sin was so far, and now it's, you know, you're so good, and you've turned completely. Uh, I think it gives way to the different ways it's represented, or not. So that in Islam, we, you also don't have the same kinds of, uh, generally speaking, okay, these long days. also have the notion of Islam. Yeah. Islam the past is I think that's where it is. That's, yeah. yeah, just to, to jump in on that, I, I think you know, one of the differences is in, in Judaism, conversion isn't a necessary part of the, the narrative of the Jewish people, whereas Christianity is all about conversion. It's, if I'm allowed to use this word, uh, it's because it's an obsession with the past, but it's also an obsession with the future. Because Christianity is all about the transformation of the old covenant into the new covenant, the former chosen people becoming the new chosen people. So every conversion of every Jew is becomes a potential narrative to show how it's been, how it should be, and how it's going to be, and to reinforce the Christian's idea that we're not what we were, but we're, this is where Jews are going to, and they're all going to see the light someday. So it's a reassuring and necessary narrative, whereas there's no need for a Jew to do that in the same way. And, and, and Islam, of course, it's, it's a, important in a different way, as we'll probably get to in some of the other papers. Okay, let's thank again the speakers for their interesting talks. The couch is ready, you are. You can enjoy the conversion of food into energy. <laughs>